Welcome, everyone. It's good to see you again. This is now our third iteration of Language Matters face to face again since the, uh, uh, you, well, you know the word. <laughs> you pick, pick your choice there. It's good to see everyone again. I'm uh, Tomas de Suscarza. I'm the director of the Texas Language Center and associate professor in the Department of Slavic and Eurasian Studies. I am so glad to see people coming in for these Language Matters talks again. This is our forum now in its for 11th year uh, in which UT faculty uh, and graduate students all teaching are teaching specialists come together to talk about what works, what doesn't work, what we'd like to see, what we need to have being done in our classroom. Um, and I'm just so happy because this is our last iteration for the fall semester and for the year. And we have a very special guest indeed. I will introduce him in 30 seconds, which just want to remind you by the, in the corners you came in the room and by the way, coffee and, and pastries if anyone needs to fuel themselves in the corner. There's also to remind everyone, since most of you are yourselves in the classroom, either taking language or uh, teaching language right now to remind, if you're teaching in particular, to remind your students, a little shameless self-promotion, right? To say, hey, you're enjoying this, right? Be sure and nominate your instructor for uh, our it's the only language uh, teaching award at the University of Texas dedicated only to language instruction. So we give, we've got some winners in the room here with us, um, both at the um, tenure tenure track level as well as the instructors of, of the profession, called professional track instructors, and graduate student instructors. Uh, have been awarded this. So please do nominate your instructors, or if you're faculty in the program, tell your, tell your students, hey, there's an extra five points on your final exam if you nominate me, right, that kind of thing. Uh, also, please remember that the TLC still receives a, a, a modest but a reasonable sum of money for professional development, which we distribute to all any language teaching faculty with reasonable proposals. So also there is a uh, QR code as well as an online application. They're very easy to apply for, and we use up every last cent that we're given by College of Liberal Arts. We try to make sure anyone, any worthwhile project does indeed get funded. So please be sure to do that. And I do hope you'll all join us again next, oh, come on in, come on in. Uh, join us again next semester when we bring back Language Matters and keep checking the Texas Language Center websites for updates on uh, programs in progress, as well as things like the Teaching Award. So uh, let me get on with it. We're introducing our guest speaker today because I'm very, very excited about and wanting to hear his talk as well. So it's my distinct pleasure to introduce our visiting Fulbright professor, uh, professor, I assume to be professor, a full Fulbright scholar from Moscow, Kirill Lusyokin. Uh, Kirill comes to us from Moscow State University where he's um, a, been working on his PhD thesis on David Foster Wallace. He comes to the University of Texas because of our Harry Ransom Center, our research center in the humanities that does, as so many things in Texas, we own the entire uh, entire group of, of uh, writings and manuscripts of David Foster Wallace. And so he has a rich, um, a rich archive in front of him. His topic is the poetics and border and the limit of the works of David Foster Wallace. He is trying to come up with a theoretical basis of the aesthetic and symbolic representation of concepts such as geopolitical, bodily, and temporal borders in the works and limitations, including human capability and language, and the impossible to go beyond these borders. It's a very heady and wonderful project that we are looking forward to working with us for the remainder of this academic year. Meanwhile, while a PhD candidate at Moscow State University, Kido has been a teacher and instructor of English as a, a foreign language in, in Russia, and indeed are, uh, has been an instructor of that language now for the past years, and that's part of the uh, essence of his work. We're really fortunate to get in here because, as you know, getting um, any faculty, students, or scholars in from the Russian, the borders of Russia and the Russian Federation today is not simple, but indeed Fulbright has been very good about finding ways to ensure that not only these this flow of knowledge and specialists and scholars comes in, but that they get to share their scholarship with groups like ours here. So presenting today through the thorns of translation and interpretation, how to make literature speak the same language as our students, it is my pleasure in welcoming, and please help me welcome, Kirill Vistilke. 
Thank you so much for coming to this talk today. Actually, this is like my uh, first public appearance uh, in terms of this scholarship, so it's really meant to work to me. So uh, I'm gonna anxious over it. So I'm gonna like use my speech text as a crush thing. So I hope that uh, after this speech, we're gonna interact about this topic because it's some kind of like intersection of different parts of me, what I'm doing. Uh, as I, as Professor Garza uh, told you, I'm doing my uh, PhD on contemporary American literature. I've been teaching Western literature, and I will tell about this more. Uh, I will elaborate on this more. And uh, English. So it's kind of interesting way to see uh, how it's all intertwined and what it can bring. Because uh, I have some issues over like teaching literature and how it can change the whole academic environment for me. So um, I'd like to start with a very intricate remark. Uh, after I've made up my mind on the topic of the oh, okay, so uh, weird two things, yeah. Okay, so um, I would like to start with an intricate remark. So when I um, find uh, when I've made up my mind with the topic, I would like to uh, share with you today. Uh, one of my um, colleagues from Moscow State University, she texted me. Why should we change the literature for students? Let them adapt to literature. So it seems to me that uh, in cohorts, I found the crux of the conflict of the story I want to share with you today, because this is something uh, which actually um, is very considerable when we think that it's just worth changing. So a dash of clickbait, but it seems to me that literature is toxic. So every time it comes to literature, a person involuntarily feels as if like, Bookshelves crushing on, on them, snobbery, parasitism on literature as a demonstration of social status, but more importantly, detachment from the problems of today and the possibility of career process. The Takis have been crowding humanities for a long lifetime before. So back in 1981, uh, Carnegie congratulated the graduates of the Pierce College of Business for being fully occupied in obtaining a knowledge of shorthand and typewriting rather than wasting time upon dead languages. So today the situation is much more problematic. It was, it's worth looking at the academic agenda and it will become clear that philology is the last thing that humanity is interested in today. And the first thing that if anything can be neglected and it's pretty scary prospect for me. So the humanities has the tiniest percentage of researchers with a doctorate, only 8% of the total, 45% less than in the 70s in general. And this sphere is experiencing the brain drain. As they say, the most uh, uh, gifted students go to the field of natural sciences and technology. So usually, um, this is usually objected to by the fact that literature and the arts help to develop some sort of like horizons, a sense of language, and creative thinking. And even like, um, sorry, and even like um, Nobel laureate Joseph Brodsky was, out, was also trying to say that literature is something that helps people to be, that they are not able actually to commit violence and all that stuff, but uh, which unfortunately is not confirmed today. And we will not see any impact of culture for preventing some sort of wars and all these conflicts. Uh, so at that point, it puts us in a position of existential crisis regarding the um, value of studying humanities. One Russian science communicator, Andrew Kanyaev, coins the term humanistic singularity, uh, arguing that in today's realities, people have lost faith in the basic moral issues and foundations of a humanistic society. And now we are unable to answer basic questions, such as why is it bad to kill? And why is it important to tell the truth and all that stuff? So at that point, it, um, it brings us to the question why it happened and what should we do for that. Does that imply that literature does not really give the student anything? Or to paraphrase, there is a very nice quote I liked from a quote, he's not here, but he says that human intelligence is just a peacock feather. It's some sort of like Darwinistic approach to that. But uh, my change of it would be is literature just a consequence of peacock feather, what human intelligence actually is? So in my opinion, everything does not look so tragic if we look at those with whom we actually work with the students. So most likely, their main request from higher education today will be a stable future. So what I'm getting at is work, earnings, and what is more important, non-aging skills, as we can say. 
But as we can also see among the Gen Z, they have a request for resolution of emotional uh, difficulties, the ability to build new communications and conduct a dialogue as a concept. So, and it seems to me that if you show the uniqueness and value of the soft skills more often, it can solve the issue. But why does such a gap between a student and a subject can rise? So I call it four horsemen of the literary apocalypse. Uh, so let's see. The first one is the lack of commonality with the past. To the student of the modern paradigm, the problems and stories of people of the past seem extremely disconnected uh, from their realities. And our task is to bring the experience of people uh, that is like contained in books as close as possible to the experience of students uh, and for this, we need to understand what problems they are concerned about today. There is Amanda Klebo, Harvard's Dean of the Undergraduate Education. She said that uh, students actually lost their bearings in the past. The last time I taught the Scarlet Letter, I discovered that my students were really struggling to understand the sentences as sentences. So like having trouble identifying the subject and the verb. So the second point is speaking, uh, about speaking about that gap is shame, guilt, and fear of ignorance. So the art environment is a priori toxic, since it often receives its validation from by demonstrating the continuity of tradition and cultural baggage. How many times have I put phrases in the styles of, have you not watched Tarkovsky? Or like teacher is saying, I can tell from the eyes of the student whether he has read the Iliad or not. <laughs> so, you know, all these things create some sort of like detachment and generates the aversion to the subjects, bullying and actually some smart shaming as well. So the second of the third point is paternalism. Uh, often wrong literature is taught in the form of lectures where feedback is minimized uh, which is why students has no motivation to get involved into the academic process, and it creates this alienation from the dialogue. So, in addition, such a hierarchical model um, panders to ageism and gives uh, the teacher the status of knowing and like, hence the student of the um, ignorant one. And the last one, thanks to the film Lost in Translation, I think it's some sort of it was very like <clears throat> it's always something we do know, but we don't actually like look at this. So. Let's imagine every, every year, the student are given some sort of set test. And it's something that we live with it, and it's okay. But the thing is, in looking from the Soviet tradition of translation, it has become somewhat very explicitly um, pure that it's something wrong with it. So what I was trying to say is that the set test list is always determined language-wise. So approved lists are compiled based on the text translated into the student's native language. And often they are not amenable to revision, but inherit the tradition of teaching. So in that point, Russian speaking culture, there is a Soviet tradition of literary translation, which is fixed in academic terms, and based on which a picture of the perception of the development of literature actually is formed. So in this sense, translation determines the frame of the literary timeline and reduces the possibilities of interpretation of the cultural and historical context, which only leads to alienation as well. For example, it was kind of an interesting way to see the syllabus of the world literature here and compare it to the Russian ones, because I've seen many different texts and they're absolutely different. So the way, for example, we perceive, uh, we perceive uh, Ernst Theodor Amadeik of Hoffman is totally different from what people read here. So it's like different, it's like Hoffman doppelgangers all over the world. It's kind of a weird thing, I, I would say. <laughs> So at that point, actually, that leads to a variety of approaches to teaching literature. Uh, so, yeah, uh, the first one, it's called like the banking model, as, uh, as Professor Gardner helped me to plan, or the cultural model. And it's something that actually uh, supports all the previously described gaps. It's something of a top-down system with all this uh, in a, like, inability to have a conversation with a student. So frequently I experienced uh, the method of teaching where the, the, the teacher gave an hour and a half lecture without the direct need for interaction with students. So students mostly do not read the proposed text before classes. And in fact, during the lecture, they receive a frame of perception of the historical and literary context. And then they are engaged in essentially seeing the ideas presented by the lecturer from the proposed work, but not reading. So from the, uh, from the most part, such classes are reduced to the need to pass an exam and can be called, find out what the teacher thinks and regurgitate it back at him first. 
So at that point, this is actually how it works most of the time, as I've seen. So the second strategy makes use of literature to practice language skills. And at that point, uh, this is a very beneficial way when we want to uh, dwell into the uh, peculiarities of the language context, but it diminishes the impact of the book and the emotions and all these like things of the background. So uh, the third one, which is called the personal growth model, I would like uh, to elaborate on. So the third one aims to elicit personal response and fosters uh, and foster students' personal development. So this approach motivates and encourages students to read by making a connection between the things of the text and their personal and life experience. So I would like I, I would say that to make sure that literature is not associated with a dusty armchair critic uh, escapist, I would like to turn to narrate narrative practices. It's like that's the thing that came from the psychology and therapy thing, but we actually need to narrativize literature, to narrativize the narration. It's kind of a meta thing, but it would work. So at that point, moving in the direction of the decolonization of the content of lectures of the world literature, it's worth deploying optics towards the decolonization of the process of teaching literature and deconstruction of hierarchical mm, teaching methods. So trying to contrive an alternative plus design, I proposed a model based on four main elements when studying both literature. So what I found was critical thinking, um, uh, empathy and emotional intelligence, intercultural communication, which is connected with translation, and relevance, or to be like particular in the understanding of cultural industries. So at that point, I will show how each of the presented dominance was implemented in the teaching process. So it's going to be somewhat like a case study, I would say. So let's start. The first class was about uh, Hoffman, as I mentioned before. So that was about the uh, mythology and romantic irony. So we can see the reading list of the texts we had to read. So using the methods of inquiry-based learning, specifically guided inquiry, the question was, why is Hoffman so close to the modern reader? And we were trying to find not the historical context that was mm, that you can boil down the book, but the things that actually um, some sort of frames the perception of life of ourselves. So at that point, I tried to show the students that in many ways, the romantic discourse and the worldview system are much closer to modern culture than it might seem rather than reading the philosophical works of Schlegel, Fichte, or Hegel. So each student has some ideas about the culture and art of a particular period before getting connected with the text. Further, when reading in fact a series of cognitive mm, dissonances arises, which can be explained through the peculiarities of the poetics, historical context, the author or the author's personal life, and the worldview of the epoch. So each class began with an attempt to capture what most clearly made students wonder what made them relate to the characters, through which images it was easier for students to understand the author's intention. And during the class, we try not to explain the motivation of writing a story through the historical context, but to deduce it from the story by itself, from the features of the motivation of the characters. So at that point, to increase the level of engagement, it can lead us to creative writing as well. And it's possible to offer classes related to direction of creating writing when the study text become a support for the creation of your own books. And that leads us to the second class. And it was the most I would say tiresome one, because this is about French romantic confession literature. And this is all about French Revolution, and you can hardly read it, because it's all about Mona. And it's hardly, it's like something that even, uh, even all of my colleagues were trying to neglect. But looking through the perspective of this trauma trend, as we could tell, and all these like uh, healing experiences, if we look at this text as some sort of like self-help literature, it has become a very interesting thing. So I was trying not to give them the understanding of this French Revolution background, but I was trying to look and ask them for their traumas that they are not able to share or to share within this creative right of things and see how they are actually correlated with those that people had like centuries ago. So at that point, uh, to make matters worse, so these students at the lectures, they were invited to read some political texts of the history of France in the 19th century, uh, which were supported to explain the reasons of the creation. So you see the emotional part and emotional attachment of that was actually like neglected by lecturing. 
So to overcome this, I chose the strategy of what I call this like Socratic dialogue, I think, uh, which involved building a system of argumentation and implementation through questions, which allow students to reach the theoretical aspects of ego literature by themselves. So I was not trying to give them the theory of this ego literature, but we were trying to answer the questions, which one? Why am I talking about myself? That is, it looks as if it's an easy one, but it's a hard one. The second was, why do people record traumatic experiences? How are trauma and the practices of writing and speaking about related? Why do my thoughts become public? Uh, what works have you read uh, where authors' own personal experiences were used in the spotlight? What is the difference between confession and autobiography? And is it possible to believe the author if he defines his work as an autobiography? So at that point, creating this step system of asking of all these questions, students can build up their own theoretical um, frame and then using their personal trauma experience, they can read this text and relate to them, uh, but not going through the historical background. So let's move forward to the third one. And that was the intercultural communication and translation. This is my favorite one actually, because again, the poetry of English romanticism is um, something that is very widely known. And there is a huge tradition of uh, translating Russia, uh, romantic, romantic poetry and Soviet uh, culture. Uh, but the thing is, students were asked to read the preface to lyrical ballads uh, composed by William Wordsworth. And there was the point. So the students were said that Wordsworth, what was his mm, intention? That every language is best suited for poetry, that expression of feeling is more important than action or plot. Okay, got it. Then they were proposed to read the poem A Night Piece in translation. And the thing I found out is the students did not understand how the preface and poem is related. So I was trying to find the reason why it happened. And then we saw that the translation of this text didn't correspond to what Wordsworth were trying to say. So at that point, to solve this problem, uh, it was suggested to read the poem in the original with this interlinear translation to show its example, uh, to show by its example what Wordsworth meant. And then students saw what's the difference between the romantic poetry and the poetry that was created before. At that point, translation can be very deterministic in that way. And we should try, and this is why language is also a bridge that can get uh, a student and a subject. But the second, uh, but then I had another class on the same topic and I decided to make it different. And that was actually the thing that, which was very mm, uh, thought provoking for me. So the same tactic mm, was used for kids' lyrics. But here I went further and I suggested in another class to understand the cultural policy of Great Britain and Greece through the conflict over the Parthenon models. So actually, the most default scenario was just to read the text of kids' poetry. But we went to we went through Ode on a Grecian Urn, which led us to Byron and his poetry, The Curse of Minerva, that actually led us to Lord Eldin and his. Uh, and he being uh, looting all these popcorn things, which led us to the Great War of Independence. And actually the whole, like the initial phase was Stephen Fry and his exchange support. So that was some sort of like pop cultural hook that made them think about all this uh, literature before them. And then we went to like King Charles and all these things with MPs and the politics. So the, mm, the thing is, uh, the romantic poetry has become some sort of like a springboard to think about the actions that actually should be made today, but not literature per se. So uh, an even more aggravating problem is actually like the uh, factual errors in the translation uh, literature that makes it impossible to understand the work. So uh, some Soviet translators contain the errors, but they have not been revised. And these texts are still circulating in the academic environment. To illustrate this example, I would like to tell an amusing story of one of the most famous Soviet translators, Hermann Tchaikovsky, and his book, I Honor the Art of Translation. So, uh, do I need actually to read it? Because you can read it, and I think you would have, you would find the reason why it's so hilarious. So, have any, has anybody known the author, Cherry Orchard? <laughs> That's the thing. So, one just one mistake of the task employee created a fuss around the uh, the, whole, um, the differences between Borkis and Chekhov's uh, whole, um, dramas. I can give you a minute, minute just to read.
So you see, this is the thing that like, it's just like one of the stories from the uh, from this book, but there are so many different areas that um, impedes the understanding of the text. For example, even Tchaikovsky, he was one of the translators of Mark Twain. And there are so many mistakes that actually did not make us understand what Wayne was implying. And this is the thing, because like, uh, even it's just like the slight difference, but sometimes there are factual errors that make us create our far-fetched uh, image of Mark Twain, which is not correspond to the real one, if we, can, if we can say about the real one. So at that point, the last class was about Edgar Allan Poe's and the main question that is increasingly emerging today in the context of the attention economy is the value of reading and its relevance to today's world. So when interacting with works, uh, the task is often to understand the historical and literature context. However, for example, using the literature of Edgar Poe, it's possible not only to show how romantic ideas are deeply rooted in the production of today's pop culture. We see all the easy uh, industry can be easily uh, deconstructed if you know what Paul was created. Or, for example, you can see all these mm, genius concepts and like uh, personality and nationalism. So all these things that are actually created at that time, and you can see them from the literature, and you can see how you can work with them for today. But with uh, Paul, it was easy to, to show them the real practical means that you can use, for example, to create, uh, to create scripts, to create uh, content to create media and entertainment because he like uh, using the literature of his uh, of like his detective stories or his science fiction or his uh, mystical novels it it can it, um, it's easy to see the tropes that are still using uh, that are still used nowadays so through reading both students can develop different mindsets through which they can explain understand and create all this literature or any other type of content. The study of all these stories in conjunction with the tradition of Gothic literature shows the mechanism of a huge variety of artistic narratives of the modernity. So uh, coming, uh, coming to the end, each class became valuable in itself, but my, my idea was the focus of attention was shifted from the text itself to the skill that can be developed when working with the text. So this, um, that is, in, in the case, literature becomes partly a means of solving different problems that people can face today. Not just the literature as something of a marble or throne statue, you can just uh, religiously uh, look at that and that's it. So literature in that way is somewhat tailored to the students' demands and problems, which makes it more humane in my opinion, but there are some caveats to this tactic. So my question was like, how to give the student a sense of temporal development of literature, whether the need to give knowledge is not lost in all of this, whether the discreteness of the student and consciousness is not enhanced because of this. Uh, but so rather still a lot of work to do again. So as an epilogue, I would like to paraphrase Sheldon Pollock, the professor at Columbia University, who said that in the era of dominant capitalism, choosing the most non-instrumental way of education, that is studying a non-modern language or classical literature or history, means uh, to choose the most oppositional and radical way of life. And I think we should actually embrace it. <laughs> yeah. So that's it for today. Okay. Thank you. I hope I hope you'll be willing to take a few questions later. Yeah, uh, some there were some. I still have questions to this. <laughs> so may I open the floor? Yeah. I would love to hear more about how you use translation in the classroom and how you sort of scaffolded that for students. Um, I've never taught translation, but I've taken a number of translation classes, and I'm wondering how much uh, you engaged the students in the actual sort of translation project versus presenting translations. Like, what what did that look like on the ground? That was a correct thing because uh, it's easy to do with poetry because if you take like just a small piece of some sort of like of part of poetry, even if a person doesn't know language, we can use all these dictionaries and different gadgets. So at that point, technologies help us to to see this, and they just see the words that can be like uh, and how what they mean in Russian. So at that point. Uh, I'm just trying to give an example, like, you know, all these, like, made-up Baroque literature when there are so many different metaphors and all that stuff, and they had actually this experience before in previous classes, the previous semester, and then look into the translation of the words they see in romantic poetry, they see it's just like, you know, the moon is moon, the, the sky is sky, and they, okay, now I see, because in translation it was very 
uh, complex and sophisticated and like it, it it felt as if the translator was trying to like to spice it up just to make it more you know picturesque but that was not the intention of what's work so just seeing all these uh mm, interlinear translation helps them to see just like even to have a glimpse of it and again we should have to hand it to them they had uh 11 years of, of learning english then they have that three years of learning English as well at the uni. So they should probably be able, they, they should be able to somewhat like translate most the easiest thing. But it doesn't work for prose, for example. That's the thing. Oh, interesting. Thank you. Yes. Oh, please talk. Okay. Yes, thank you very much. Great yeah. talk. Um, my question would be um, uh, isn't there like any? I don't know, it feels like for me at least that like your initial like um, assumption basically by um, so you said that like you want to like keep the floor to students basically kind of yeah and so but like what's your last quotation so like uh, this first uh, assumption is like pretty progressive and like I, I, I could like uh, double it but like the last quotation is like uh, I would say that it's like pretty conservative so basically you're like um, mm -hmm. uh, so like the last last one, uh, one? yeah yeah okay. so it feels at least yeah. that way so basically uh, you sh I, I read it as like we should help to our our like older ways of education <laughs> or or, or no, do, do I get it wrong like okay a final phrase. No, I do understand what you mean. It's like, again, actually, this approach towards humanities is also like Romanistic, somewhat extent. Yeah, I was just, like, my first, like, my initial intention was just, uh, I think that teaching literature today, just for literature, just like to all these knowledge enhancing machine wouldn't work. Because like, uh, I know a lot of people who uh, they haven't read a good book and they are actually wise people. Or I know a lot of people who read who read a lot of books and they are unable to have like a decent conversation. <laughs> so, so that's the point. Like I think that uh, there is such a, a conventional wisdom in the academia that literature is something we should like uh, perish and like cherish and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But we actually should use it as the means of something. Mm -hmm. Because, like, we should use it, like, for example, French confession when he used to speak about your traumas and how to overcome them. Or, for example, like, this is a good literature, for example, to speak about wartime trauma, because they had such experience, now we have such experience, and that would be the bridge to speak about them. But not just to make them learn French literature, because there is no actual reason for that. They're trying to find something practical. But again, on the other hand, I'm just feeling all these, like, you know, all this pressure of my Soviet professors who would say, you are just a weak fool. <laughs> if I could tag on to Andrew's question a bit here about the, 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 not just the role of translation, but the translations themselves. I'm thinking of, we take kind of the, the most classical examples from the Soviet period, uh, the translation of Shakespeare into Russian. So there was Marshak's, uh, Marshak's original versions that try to mimic the Renaissance English of Shakespeare and were quickly replaced both in, in popularity but mainly in quality by Pasternak's mm -hmm. translation of, of Shakespeare. And many Russians during sort of my generation would say and continue to say, Hamlet in Russian is the best Hamlet of all. <laughs> and when you read a translation of Hamlet into Russian, that's what Shakespeare really wanted to say, because it excuses all of this Renaissance language and instead puts it in in a con contemporary vernacular of the 1950s. So when when you when for you the question for your classes, do you take into account in this balance of using the original versus using the translation, the actual translation, you know, what was involved in making the translation itself? What were the cultural, uh, political in particular, the Soviet translations, political implications of what did it mean to put something like the great Shakespeare into vernacular Russian? Do you take those questions into consideration? I, mean, I would say that's the thing, and I think we're just going through that phase in the Russian academia now, because like uh, most of the lecturers are these like of Soviet school, mm -hmm. and they have all these like preferred translation and all of this. And the thing is like, there are many like, 
as you said, there are many cultural layers on the translation. There are actual layers of like meaning on yeah. the original. So you should like, if you really want to know what he was trying to say, you just need to go through that. And that's impossible. Yeah. Because like, then you would find out that like the sailors were staging Hamlet uh, while they were doing like all these uh, journeys. And like, what is like, for just all electric tailors, uh, sailors were just playing Hamlet. Yeah. And for, for us, it sounded like Hamlet. So it's like, that there is so I would say that the question is your intention to tell about Shakespeare, mm -hmm. like what are you trying to uh, to tell about? For example, like I don't have uh, this book here, but I found a book that's called uh, "Literature is Bad for You," mm -hmm. and there was a quote of like Hamlet is just like a big of man. That's it. So that would be the intention, like to tell you, or you want to show, like you, I don't know, you want to show the way people were. Mm, um, I don't know, relation to theater at that mm -hmm. time or something. Like, or for example, uh, Shakespeare can be a good thing of speaking about intellectual property of that. So it's like not just Shakespeare by itself. And at that point, I wouldn't say that the types of translation uh, would actually like mean something to that point because like trying to see, that's a good thing, but it's more for advanced learners. That's the thing. Like if we speak yeah. about world literature, it's always about introduction, introduction thing. For example, as I've mentioned before, I'm doing this Western literature. We don't have to, I don't know, but I feel as if in Russia, there is no world literature as a, sub, as, as a thing. We have Western canon, and that's the thing. So now actually we need to decolonize this thing first. And then we're gonna speak about something. So it's like, we, we feel as if like Shakespeare is like the, you know, the spring word of the whole literature of the world. That doesn't work for us. So, uh, at that point, translation would be like speaking about the difficulties and differences of translations. It's somewhat for like further down the road. If you see, if you want to try to convey and give the understanding of what like language was. But the thing is, we speak about the undergraduates. Yeah, they are unable. Even they are not unable to like the English speaking students are unable to read Shakespeare in original. So and that would be like this is a roadblock. So to diminish it, we need to make it more close to them. And so then we're going to speak about Pasternak, Marshak, and the Venus. So for, for these courses that you were talking about where your case studies were done, what would you say roughly is the percentage of reading the, liter the literary works in the original and reading them in Russian translation? I would say everything that is connected with poetry and short stories, they are able to read an original. Okay. So, but again, half of it will. The cup would not be able because of the language problem, uh, language difficulty. So at that point, it's just like one of the means if you want to make them understand. You can use it. For example, there is a thing I, I, I can't recall what was the let me, let me see. For example, there is a thing about uh, Edgar Poe's novels. My first contention when we when were speaking about it was just do you think what's the inner like core uh, emotion of the person? Is it is a person good at that? Like, the, like, just a silly word of thing to decide. And there is a black cat, the story of Edgar Poe, where he used this term. I just, I'm just going to try to find it. But there is a special, like, it's called, um, there was the imp of perverse. Mm -hmm. It's like the thing that, uh, that he was trying to tell what's the crux of the human identity is. So the way it was translated into Russian, it's somewhat like, you know, just like, just, Silly nature. Yeah. So at that point, they would not actually understand what yeah. he was trying to tell. Yeah. But they did, but they don't need to read the whole black cat in the original mm -hmm. because they can see the plot. The plot can be translated easily. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to some sort of like the um um the so the, the, the underlying meaning. The yeah, the many things mm -hmm. that that's even mm -hmm. difficult to translate. Mm -hmm. that, so. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question. Mm -hmm. yeah. I just thank you for the lecture that I just really uh, can relate uh, with the teaching things like we want to engage the students very much. So my question is, if you still sometimes think that some historical, for example, background is important for some story about, for example, from the French Revolution times, and you think you think that some historical event or year or name, like is important and students should know that to understand some some ideas you want to teach in class. Um, how would you introduce that like in an engaging way? Did you have an experience? Would you just tell like, this is the year when blah, blah, blah. 
Yeah. Would you do it somehow differently? I mean, maybe you didn't need that because you are you focused on the skills. But if it's like necessary, then what? what uh, oh, I usually try to look uh, to history as more of like you know the hubs of different like ideologies and ideas that were around that time. Mm -hmm. For example, like speaking about romantic period. It's easy to tell about all these like constructions that were created at that time. So you don't actually need to to say the name of the like of, of emperors and wars, but you just say like that was that that was this thing. So for example, like there there was no such thing as like personal identity. You would see like in previous eras and mm -hmm. in previous like centuries, and then here we see like a person against the society. Mm -hmm. So why does it happen? Yeah. But again, you can tell some of the facts that would make uh, an impact of it. Because let's say, uh, as to Hoffman, you can read it as a fairy tale, or you can learn some of the historical facts and you will see it as a satire to some sort of all these like mm -hmm. different, like the way the country was detached. Like there was no such Germany as a country at that time. So there were many different uh, kingdoms and all that stuff. So and that's actually his metaphor of uh, the way people were living there. Right. Or, for example, this um, rationalistic way of thinking and uh, all these like enlightenment and the drawbacks of enlightenment, you can see from some of his stories. But that's the thing. If you want to make them focus their attention on it, you can tell about it. Mm -hmm. But um, some like I just found out that like some of the students, they just want to feel some sort of like relation to the text and they say, I just love that thing. And you just say, you should actually say that's good. Because, for example, my professor was saying, <clears throat> you haven't like you haven't understood this story at all. <laughs> and I would just say, like, you know, I just like uh, that's really sad that like he killed the black cat. And, like, <laughs> and actually, that's it. Like you missed the point. <laughs> you missed the point. This is nothing like I would say that uh one my professor was very rude, she would use some cursive language to the to the say like oh you're dumb. That's the end. So you see, it's like very strict uh, environment. So at that point, it actually makes me, for example, I hate uh, Marcus just because I was traumatized by him someone. <laughs> so I mean, if we try to um, to make them feel that it's something interesting, we should do it because, you know, this is the question that I was playing, that's been framed on my mind. What is the actual role of the lecturer at that time? Because you can actually make them love literature just because you want to share your passion for it. And if you found just one minor interesting thought about that book, and I would like praise you for that, you would go and read it further down the road. And that's the thing. We need to make them feel as literature is something they like they they would like to, to do like in their life. Because no. most people they just like they just read it uh, as a set text and just forget it all the time. And getting back to a question about historical things, I would say um, it's just again the matter of the level of um, deepness you want to go with a group and you should see what students really want because there can be a group of very advanced readers and then you would see oh they brought these ideas to the table now I should elaborate on them so if you have a, th this is the same thing with uh, language uh, learning like I have a, I have uh, last year I had two groups uh, of um, English language group one was a1 is like the advanced one and one was a11. So it means like the first one, uh, we were able to speak about, you know, flat sentences and all this inversion. And A11 group was something like, let's learn the numbers. <laughs> so <laughs> am I able to tell uh, the flat sentence grammar to the A11 group? I am, I, I, I'm able. But they would never give this an entity. They would never understand this. So at that point, usually we attribute literature to the students as they are all equal. But when we speak about languages, we diversify them. So why we, why, why shouldn't we do it to lectures or to lecture in literature as well? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I agree. I just thought that sometimes it can be very important, some detail. No. But when you introduce it, it's boring. And then you think, how should I introduce it in an engaging way? For example, you're, you're, well, you're, 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 you're true. Yeah, you're, you're right. Yeah, about the the levels. Yeah, the, the, the depth. Of the yeah, and yeah. again, uh, when we were when, when we were talking about Byron, I was always just doing all this clickbait based stuff. I was speaking about his personal and sexual life, and it actually makes them laugh. By it. and they started reading all this poetry. They didn't see all that in poetry, but they just grasped grasp this image of Byron doing all that stuff. 
And they say, well, I love it, guys. That's a good way, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I have another practical question for all this. So um, I wonder, um, are you talking like about, so you have have um, you have here like four topics? Is it like four lectures or like? No, they were like, I had like six different groups mm -hmm. and we had all the, the system of the colloquiums, mm -hmm. like the seminars, and there was just four seminars in every, in every group. Mm -hmm. But I, I had to name them like 16 different seminars. And I was just trying to 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 see different schemes with different groups to see how it works. So at that point, it's more of just like the this is this third, uh, there is this is the second, the sophomore year when they are doing this romantic period. Mm -hmm. But uh, for example, I made four different classes on FR4 and found which fits better for example. So each of your case studies was a separate seminar, or yeah, uh, okay. It's like each. It's like I would say every slide I showed you today is just like every class is a combination of four different types of uh, lecturing the same material. But like, what about like readings? Uh, you have to read. is it like required readings for students? You or... mean the set test? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the thing you have to give and take with the lecture mm -hmm. because we have these lectures and then they have these set text uh, list and the uh, there is a like exam thing they have the list of all these questions they need to answer but again uh with the way we were taught i was doing uh western literature mm, the way they were working during uh, on all these uh, seminars i made them i eliminated the exam at all so i just uh, they just showed their pro progress on understanding the literature and they made different interesting texts and their focus so the exam was just you know just imparting some um, experiences over all this time and they actually really loved it so they don't uh there was not such thing as just you have to read it mm -hmm. the only one is just one girl she was trying to make me think as if she read Notre Dame de Paris but she like cheated and I was just like okay you have one night see you tomorrow <laughs> but it was more of like you know it's more of, it was more of a challenge thing so yeah we don't need to make them like you can make them read all of this, but you know, from Russian perspective, how they just do it. Mm -hmm. They don't read it. They use all these like digestions and all that stuff and it doesn't work. Yeah, but also it's not the student's fault because like- It's not the student's fault. They read it exactly. fast. So, yeah. says that, yeah, so. This is why I was trying to apply. For example, uh, let me sh let me show you. For example, as to the reading list of the Edgar Paul, it's like, even if all of these are short stories, it's a huge thing you need to read. So what I tried to do is just for one group, we made the detective plus. Mm -hmm. So they read just three stories and we were trying to see, we were trying to see what would be the cliched uh, chain of events from every detective story. Mm -hmm. The second class was about science fiction and we were trying, we were speaking about conspiracy theories, about UFO, about all that stuff and how it derived to ever follow. The third class was about, was about the poetic principles and why poetry is important in his, in his works. And the, the, the fourth one was about um, horror stories. And then, like, finally, it, 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 um, for example, for me, it was clear that all of these three different genres have one special feature in common. Like, the main poetic um, means of Edgar Poe was to find, a, uh, to create a gap. And for example, if it's a detective story, it can be filled rationally. If, it, if we speak about science fiction, it can be filled uh, with knowledge, and when it's horror, it cannot be filled. So you see, you just like doing all these classes with them, reinvent the Edgar Poe's to your, even to yourself. So yeah, but the reading list, but uh, if it um, if it were the previous types of uh, seminars, they would just have to read all this thing, and that is impossible. So you said your these seminars were mostly done in like a Socratic seminar style way where you'd get up there, you kind of ask a question, the students would respond, and based on their response, you ask another question. And it's somewhat like all these like guided inquiry things. Right? Yeah, yeah. Is there anything about that format that you would change or that you think could be made more amenable to this approach? This is an interesting thing because I was just trying to that would be great to like, you know, to um, to destroy all these like hierarchy as it is. Right. But the thing is, they've been taught at schools for 11 years of this top-down system. So they came some sort of like a bit infantile. 
So it's easier for them just to see and invite, but rather than just like to to be uh, um, to be taken into that thing. So if uh, so, I had to spend like like several hours just to make them not being afraid of me. I was just like, even we have this like little um, age gap, they still thought as if like, oh, you just stay here. That means you're like a professor, so we should speak you the other way. But to diminish it, we like there is a still global drawback of the whole system as an academic environment. Yeah, that's the thing. I would like to cut just the reverse plot of it. That would be great. The HL will get bitter, by the way. It's, it's just just being there. There were time for one one parting shot, one last question or comment for for Kirill. Any other? So I, I wonder about this concept, like romantic irony. Is it like do uh, people speak? about this outside of Russia? Though. This is the thing I was telling you. So yeah. it feels as if we have our own Russian folklore. <laughs> Here we have like an Americanized version of folklore. In Germany, they have their own folklore. So I haven't seen like, I was trying to find some um, like articles on romantic irony for like, like in uh, English speaking uh, uh, journals, but there is no such thing. So it's actually the invention of the Soviet uh, scholars. So what? Oh, for example, me here. That's the thing is was well created by this Russian like Soviet translation and it's been implemented and they are elaborating on it. So it's somewhat like to 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 peel all these like uh, theoretical constructions, we should try to just have these like book a student uh, chain without all this. Like for example, uh, my seminarist he asked she asked us to read. A pile of different scientific journals, and then she would be ready to speak with me. But I was just re regurgitating all this stuff to her. That's the thing. Thank you so much for this conversation. Please join me in thanking Kirill. Thank you all of you for coming. What a great crowd today. Thank you. I hope we can keep this uh, enthusiasm and momentum going for the Language Matters series. Uh, please check out the TLC website. We, we think our offerings are always engaging and relevant. We'd love to see you all here. If nothing else, remember, you can always get a cup of coffee and a pastry yeah. when you come to our events. So, so thank you all so much for coming. Well, wonderful fall break. Yeah. <laughs>